tonight we're gonna we're gonna go on a winding road, a little bit of a, a journey. There's a lot of things I could have talked about tonight, but I wanted to go a little bit differently. I wanted to take us on on the journey of my life and some of the things I've learned, and then bring us to the future and some of the things that you see in the news. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a stressful thing looking at the news these days. There's so many things that are happening, and it's so hard to understand what's happening in the world and where we're going as a race and uh, as a species. And so I'm going to take us on this journey that's going to have light and some wonderful hope for us, uh, but there will also be some, some challenging experiences. And, and throughout the night, you'll be confronted with this, this metaphorical red pill, blue pill scenario. So to start us off, um, I, I, like most people here, I think almost everybody was, was once a child. And... <laughs> And uh, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I had some pretty significant challenges fitting in in school. Uh, I spent most of my time in the hallway and in grade six was expelled from school. Um, most people are surprised by that. How can you get expelled from grade six? Well, somehow they, they found a way. And for, <laughs> for grade six and seven, I didn't go to school. And being an only child with a mom that went to work, it was a fairly challenging experience for me. It was lonely. and. You know, much like many of us in the room, we had emotional experiences that one might today call trauma. For me, it was a traumatic experience. Um, and I went back to high school in grade eight, and then shortly after, left school again. And my mom, who's sitting over there, <laughs> was, uh, was such a wonderful inspiration. She said, if you're going to stay under my roof, you need to get a job. So there's me in, uh, in my, one of my first suits, the, 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 the gray, uh, the suit on the side. And, uh, and so I started doing door-to-door -door and then got involved in selling dishes and then got involved in car sales and then was, was engaged in the internet. And at about 17, I um, had a fantastic opportunity that came about, uh, was, was making $150,000 a year selling banner ads over the internet and working with all this new tech. Um, and uh, and so, so that led into me starting my own company at 19. And within a couple years, was at about $2 million in revenue or so and about 20 staff. But I hadn't done the work to deal with those things that had happened to me as a child. And so you can imagine with, with 20 growing on 35 staff, I was very uneasy all the time and had a lot of anxiety. And, um, and, and I found ways to cope with that, that that weren't really the most productive ways. The people that are laughing, yes, I am guessing you resonate with that. The, 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 the one with two bottles, it was one champagne bottle wasn't enough. Um, but at the time, it was wonderful. I had, I had so many things going on. And yes, that is a pile of money. I was very motivated by money. That was really how I, I counted my worth. And, and um, the photo with me accepting the award was, was winning the Business 40 Under 40 at 24. And so all these notable achievements on the outside, but, but inside was, um, was, was a really painful world. And I used alcohol to cope with that and sleeping pills. And uh, all day I would drink coffee and then at night alcohol and sleeping pills and then alcohol sometimes in the morning. And so for anybody that's been on that path, um, you'll know that that doesn't lead to wonderful places. And as that stress continued to progress in my body, all kinds of crazy things started to happen. Headaches, stomach aches, exhaustion. I got a kind of immune system, IBS kind of thing going on. And still, I ignored all of that and just kept going with what I was doing, just thinking about money, 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 money. And, and then one day, some spots appeared on my skin. It was one spot first. And, and the one spot turned into more spots. And about six months into going through doctor's appointments and trying to figure out how to deal with these spots, I found myself at a dermatologist who then sent me to the BC Cancer Agency, which then gave me a diagnosis of a stage four cancer. And I remember the oncologist saying, we're going to have to get you in for chemo right away. And I asked if I could have a couple days to explore that option. I went on PubMed, I pulled some papers, just had that kind of mind, and I saw that chemotherapy didn't change the overall survival time. And so I went back to the oncologist, and I asked him if he'd read these papers. And he said, I'm the oncologist, I don't need to read papers, I know what we're supposed to do, and we're supposed to, you to do chemo. And this was my first experience with, with structured medicine, with the medical system. And for anybody that's been through a diagnosis, you've probably learned that you have to take your own care into your own hands and really do your own research, because medicine doesn't always have the answer. And so I, I promptly fired my oncologist and then realized that I didn't have anybody helping me. Uh, and I found uh, the oncologist that didn't accept patients, and he did some more biopsies, and, and it progressed to the point that they understood and agreed that, that chemotherapy didn't change the overall survival time. 
So I was, I was faced with this situation. What do I do? How do I approach my life? And in, in the, the process of considering this, I looked at the textbooks, and I looked up my diagnosis, and this is what it was going to look like. My body was basically going to rot away until I died. And, um, and I, I looked at the graphs and the stats, and the stats were, were not very good for my type of cancer. People died within a few short years. And so my approach initially was to look at medicine in the way that most people do. How do I get a drug to kill this cancer and, and, and move on with my life? And, and so I hired an MD and built a research team and, and traveled around to try and make this drug. Um, but, but really, as I was on this journey, I realized that I had some inner work to do. And, and one of the key realizations was that I, I was sick, in part, because I didn't want to live. And for anybody who's dealt with illness, there's usually some kind of core there about how we live our life, how we ch make choices about our life, how we respect our body, how we're in line with our highest self. And, and this choice uh, of whether I wanted to live or die and what to live for, first my ego was, was I had this idea that no one would come to my funeral. I hadn't really accomplished much and I wasn't a very likable person, so I thought I'm going to do something that people will like me, and so the cancer idea was there. But the thing that really that really motivated me was, um, was, was this person. This was me and my mother. And uh, my mom made a lot of sacrifices when I was growing up. Uh, a single mom isn't easy when you're, when you're a receptionist with the government and just slightly above the poverty line. And I was in Boy Scouts and cadets and kung fu and swimming lessons and, and rugby. The rugby shoes are $350. And for any single moms in the room, Big shout out to you, because it takes a really special kind of energy to, to look after and, and, and take care of a child in this world, and single fathers too. And, and so I just couldn't bear the idea of letting down mom and going to tell her, hey, I'm dying from cancer. So it really motivated me. It motivated me to choose something different. And where the medical system had said, hey, you're, you're, you're not going to make it, um, or hang on for a drug, and hopefully we can do it. Um, I remembered back to when I was a child, and I thought, you know, what, what might be a goal that I could take on that would defy? And I remembered this documentary I watched on Everest, and, and I thought at the time, hey, that would be cool, but I could never do it. Um, but now in this situation, the idea of instead defying that and saying five years from now, I'll, I'll summit Everest, raise a million dollars for charity, come down with no cancer, and then teach the world to do the same thing. This, this goal kind of came about in my mind, and instead of worrying about what was going to happen at the next doctor's appointment, I put Everest on my wall and on my screensaver, and I started telling people. And you really find out who your friends are at that point in time. Because <laughs> there were some people that were like, oh, that's... Uh, and then people were like, oh, that's so sad. That's so, oh, I can't stand thinking about this. And then there were other people like, yes, yes, anything is possible. <laughs> Those people became my friends very quickly. Because that mountain is a big mountain. And uh, so I realized I needed to do some inner work as well. And this started the journey of, of traveling around the world and meeting with, with people that, that had come through a process not, not healing by medicine, but by some, some inner work, some process of consciousness, some process of belief and faith and natural healing. And so I, I, I traveled with various people in various places. And, um, and what I found so interesting is that as I, as I studied with... Uh, year one med school textbooks and hundreds of books I read and thousands of papers, I really threw myself into this on one spectrum to understand the body. Um, the, the textbooks look like this, with, with various cells that, that, that move around and, and don't have a lot of consciousness, and you know, we're trying to interrupt this pathway and that pathway. What I found is when I really started to look at my body and think about it differently, looking at my cells under a microscope. Has anybody ever done dark field microscopy or looked at their blood under a microscope? One, two, okay, a couple. It's one of the most amazing things you can ever do. Because as you sit here listening to me, it's, it's not just a you, it's, it's 40 trillion cells that have an identity, they have a consciousness, they move, they're alive. Like the cell you see on the, on the screen here, this is a, an NK cell moving to, to attack things that are in your blood to take care of you and protect you. And I thought, is this cell any different than an animal, a pet that someone might have, or even all of us sitting in this room. If you were 500 meters above or a kilometer above looking down, we're just kind of sitting here. There's this crazy guy at the front of the screen moving his hands, you know. Maybe I'm the NK cell right now, but the cell in our body has, has consciousness. It has awareness. It has a choice. It's, it's much different than, than, the, than the slides that we see in the textbooks and the way that medicine 
looks at it. And so I wanted to understand how these cells thought and how their experience was. And, and so, so as we exist as people, we, we see things, we hear things, we use our senses, and we make decisions about the environment that we live in. And these decisions that we make move through our body. We, all of us have heard of cortisol, the stress hormone. There's about 47 others that are involved. And so, so when we see somebody nodding, it could be nodding, I'm going to meet you up back and beat you up and it's going to be totally unsafe or yeah I'm totally on board with you and I really love this idea and so as we perceive that it moves through our body our brain releases these chemicals and they move through our, our all of our blood vessels and they touch these cells in our body we create an experience for the cells in our body and so for someone like me who is not living a very peaceful life, anxiety, depression, anger, frustration, all these things all the time. When this illness came about, it wasn't really a big mystery to think about why these cells might be behaving the way they are. And it, it gave me a little bit of things to think about. This is the metaphorical iceberg. At the top, we have what we're aware of our consciousness, and, and below we have all these things that are in our subconscious mind. And, and for me, there was a lot of currents under there that I needed to do work on. In my journeys, I, I, I spent some time with a man named Stephen Gilligan, and he uh, trained under Milton Erickson, um, one of the famous people that did trans psychology and hypnosis. And he described it like the mind and body can work in opposite directions, and when they pull in opposite ways, it creates pressure, and then it slips. And like an earthquake, it tears down the structures that we build in our life. And, and so I thought about this pressure. I thought about my heart that wanted to do something great in the world and my mind that was always consuming with not being good enough and not loving myself. And I thought about how, in a way, the body becomes a victim to the conflict between the mind and the heart. I think many people can identify with the idea of your heart says, do this, go in this direction, be all that you can be beyond your imagination. <laughs> And sometimes the mind says, no, that's not possible. You can't do that. You're not good enough. You're not worthy of that. And so in this healing journey, that was something I confronted in a really deep way. And at, at first, trying to find silence was nearly impossible. It was, it was yoga that led me to meditation. And, and in this journey with, with healing and meditation, and this is where we're going to go a little bit off the beaten path, by the way. I mentioned that I would provoke you, and it would be a red pill, blue pill. So... And so in this healing journey, six to eight hours meditation a day, I started to have some experiences. I had premonitions of things before they would happen. I had visions of things, very specific things, and then they happened. Which is a really crazy thing to say for some people. So a particular example of this, I was driving down the road, and in a very calm and peaceful place. And all of a sudden, I saw a bird fly in. It hit the window, a purple flash, and then a green flash. It was a pigeon, and then it rolled off the hood. And I was sitting there, and I jumped back, but I didn't actually hit a bird. There was no bird. I just had the sensation of hitting a bird. And because I had been experiencing a bunch of this, I decided that rather than going to where I was going to go, I would change direction and go home and not hit a bird. About five minutes later, I was driving, and sure enough, a bird flies down, hit the window, and I saw it in the same way, the pigeon move off the window. I pulled over the car, and I, I had this moment. I mean, whenever we confront a reality that's very different than what we think we live in, it's very challenging. And part of me wanted to put that in drive and get out of there and just not even think about this. Another part wanted to stop, get out of the car, and see if there was actually a bird or if I had just imagined all this. And so... The first part was, let's get out of here. And then I realized that I had to take a look. And so I stepped out of the car. And sure enough, on the road behind the car was a pigeon. And I stepped down and I touched it, you know, thinking maybe it was another bird or it had been there. Or it was just some coincidence. And sure enough, it was warm. And in that moment, I cried. And I was overwhelmed by this strange reality that we live in. You know, on the edge of death, trying to understand who I am in my consciousness. I, I, I touched something, something, something interesting and different and, and miraculous and very scary. And it was that day that I stopped meditating for almost three years. It took me that long to be courageous enough to try and explore these things that were happening to me in this journey. And as I was meditating and as I led up to that point, the peace that I was feeling, the calmness, these spots had started to fade from my body. They were almost all gone by this point in time. This cancer that was supposed to progress and consume my body had slowly faded away. 
I had one little spot left right back there. I called it my ass kicker. It kept me honest. <laughs> if I worked 100 hours a week, it would get itchy, and I would know that it was like, okay, I got to slow it down, stop. And so in one way, it was like, okay, peace, let's stop. In another way, I still had this, this mountain to climb, this goal that I had set. And it was coming on about five years, so I said, let's do it. And I went on the Everest adventure, not from the south side, but from the north side. On the south side, a little bit easier. Rocks and snow can fall on you a little bit more unpredictably, but the north side is this very long ridge climb. And so I, I endeavored to, to step out with a group of four men and, and take on this mountain, which was a 60-day adventure. The, the general odds were one in 14, doesn't make it home. And on the north side, it's a little bit more. Some, some wild and crazy experiences up there. Um, yes, that's a body up on the north side of Everest. The bodies are still there. You basically walk through a, a group of people that didn't make it. All along the path are, are bodies. And in this journey, it was so metaphorically like the journey with cancer to see so many people that, that didn't, weren't able to confront those processes or understand their deeper truth and how to make it through. And, and, and these were everywhere on Everest, just like they were in the cancer journey. And, and this photo here is, is summit day, the one photo I took. You can imagine up there with as cold as it is and taking your gloves off for a moment and your hands turning to ice, that it was quite the ordeal to take a photo. Um, but this was about 6 a.m. or so. Uh, we started at 7 p.m. at night, two liters of water, a Mars bar, and a 100-calorie gel pack, and went all through the night, um, made it to summit around 7 a.m. And so this, this journey with Everest to get to the summit is the, the amazing part. Hey, we're done. But actually, most people die on the way down. And that's where it starts to get really scary. The, the experience of Everest is kind of like um, achievements in our life. You know, we get there, and then it's so easy to lose it if we don't experience gratitude in the right way and, and connect with ourselves. And so uh, the journey down was, was a long journey. I got home by about 4 p.m., and we got into the tent and, and very quickly fell asleep. It, we weren't quite out of the death zone. We, the storm came in and we got stuck at Camp 3. And in the death zone is, uh, basically means that, that your body isn't healing. It's coming apart. And by that time, I was coughing up blood and have a fractured rib. And it, it really is quite the ordeal. Um, but I ended up falling asleep. And in the morning, when it was time to go, um, one of the people on our expedition mentioned that one of the people out of our four didn't make it back. And, and so for me, this confrontation with my life and death, and very much like the cancer journey, this was a photo of me. We were videotaping most of what we did. Um, confronted one of our people that, that on the way down had sat down, and, and uh, much like various st stops along the way for me, um, where I could barely get up, this person didn't get up. And the note that you see in the bottom is, is uh, the note that we had to write because his passport was in his pocket. And uh, up there on Everest, it was, it was very motivating in some ways to be able to achieve something great, but also to see sort of that edge of life and death. And, and so coming down off Everest, uh, I was very motivated to make a difference in people's lives, to somehow take the story that I had, I had journeyed through with cancer and these experiences and somehow translate it to a world that was, that was hurting. We, we've seen over the past two decades that as we've become less connected with each other, less connected with ourselves, depression is increasing in every major demographic. And this is leading to an increase in suicide that has really never been seen in our modern generation. And while many things in life are becoming better, we're seeing, we're seeing people progressively become more unhappy. And I really wanted to approach this because I identified with these components of the world being me and how I eventually got sick, but also somehow find a way to translate this journey. And when I was healing from cancer, one of the things I did was find plants in the jungles that help people to, to heal. And so when you heard about the later business success in my introduction, it was about looking at jungles around the world and seeing how indigenous populations use plants to bring calmness to people. And so we found some and started a business in that direction. And when I was up on Everest, I read a, a, a fair amount of books. There's a lot of time over, over three months, so Audible is great while you're climbing up and down and up and down and up and down the mountain to train and practice and equip the body. And so I built a company, and we grew it to 180 staff, and, 
And in four years, grew from an idea to $10 million a month in revenue. Uh, it was a, a wonderful time. Uh, you know, lots of wealth and fame and all that kind of stuff, um, flying around in private jets. And, um, but it was really the beginning of starting to understand how, how business and, and big business interests influence our world. The, the FDA is, is, it was a challenge. It was something that we had to navigate with plant medicine. And I knew there were pharma companies out there that, that weren't on board, that, that really drove pharmaceuticals as the way of being in the world. I had encountered those in the cancer journey and really seeing how scientists were persecuted when they talked about natural healing. Even when studies were so clear and so profound, they would be suppressed and people would be removed from journals. And, and so as we advanced this plant medicine business and people started healing and coming off their addiction to benzodiazepines and opiates and all kinds of things and living happier, healthier lives, these pharma companies started to apply pressure, pressure in the way that influenced the regulatory engines. And at first it was moving to Washington, D.C., spending quite a bit of time there uh, and, and interacting with the political structure and hoping that we could sort of talk some sense into it. I really had the idea that the FDA was there for, for, for human health and for the interests of human health. But I very quickly learned that there was a much larger agenda to the way that, that, that human health is viewed in society. In the United States, they have a bill called PDUFA, the Prescription Drug User Fees. And most people don't know that of the 22,000 people that work for the FDA, the salaries of 11,000 of those people are funded by the sale of prescription drugs. So when you look at something like the opiate epidemic, you see that, that the government regulatory agencies themselves are involved in the engine that creates this. And so as this pressure sort of came in, and we were at the, the head of this, and we were basically 70% of the market share in this new category, uh, it wasn't a very positive political time, and I had to make this decision. Was I willing to risk my life, whether it be my freedom or my life in this situation? And, and I had to say, is this really what I was here to stand for? And, um, and for the first time in my life, I, I retreated. And that was a really hard thing for me to do, to say, this isn't the hill for me to, to, to die fighting on. And so I sold the business. And I didn't sell it for as much as I wanted to, but it was enough to be on a beach and relax and not do anything. And uh, that lasted about three weeks or so. <laughs> really, for the people that say, yeah, I retire, it gets boring very quickly. So um, then I spent some of the money and invested it in the fight as a nonprofit. Much easier to advocate for a category as a nonprofit than as a business. I, I was having a conversation with some people by a campfire once and was saying, you know, making these businesses is kind of like flying an airplane into Area 51. And um, it, of course it's going to get shot down. Um, but what if we could move like a cloud? And that was part of the thinking that moved into a nonprofit because all of us in the room have a voice. And when we speak for what we believe, we create change. When people say, my vote doesn't matter, my opinion doesn't matter, it's absolutely not true. With this, this plant that we brought together, we made political friends that were strong, but we held uh, action. Um, in the middle, you have Senator Orrin Hatch, who, who being a 30-year senator and the pro tem's president of the US Senate, had a conversation with me about how, how important this category of plant medicine was. And he asked me if it was important and if it helped people. And I said, yes. And he said, then I will help you. And he led a Senate letter to the FDA and the DEA, 10, 10 senators with Bernie Sanders on the back and Orrin Hatch on the front, 56 other congressmen, 100,000 signatures on a White House petition. And for the first time ever, we stopped these regulatory agencies from closing a category. And it was a remarkable feat at the time. So in this place where this, this, this battle had been not quite as successful or gone in the way that I wanted, but unfolded in a, in a successful way that helped people in a profound, positive worldview, I, I really wanted to, to think bigger. And I thought about the planet rather than just the United States market. And I went on a little trip and read a bunch more books. And so I started to think about this, this worldview of the future and, and humanity and uh, what is it that we're, we're confronting and facing. And, and I thought about the existential threats uh, to us as a species. And obviously, there's the, the, the potential of an asteroid hitting us. You know, some of you might have heard that some asteroids flew between the moon and Earth, just narrowly missing us. Very, very... Uh, scary thing, but hard to do something about at this point. And then, of course, there's aliens for people who believe in aliens, you know, blowing up our planet. I'm hoping they'd be a little nicer. The ET scenario might be a, a little better. Um, things that are hard to control. But there are some things that we do on a daily basis that we really need to think about. And how we treat our environment is one of those things. 
most people think that when you put something in a recycling bin, that it actually becomes recycled. Few people know that the recycling that we have in Canada and the US, in the US, for example, 4,000 shipping containers a day move recycled material to China and other countries. And when it gets there, they pull the best parts out and dump the rest in landfills or in the ocean. And so we see these oceans that are full of plastic and garbage. The great Pacific plastic patch that's the size of Texas. We see our oceans acidifying and dying and creatures everywhere dying in this process. Animals getting caught in nets and swallowing plastic and dying. We think about the footprint that we have not only in the oceans, but in the air. A photo of Beijing on a sunny day covered in smog. Yet people still debate whether climate change is real. How can you debate that, really? It's not a question. Scientists agree. But you have large corporate interests that want things to go the same way they go. And for sure, the Earth has cycles. But when you make the Earth your garbage bin, of course it's going to change. Some people take a stand on the issue. You might have seen the news recently. Leonardo DiCaprio, who speaks at the UN, flies around in a private jet. When, a, when one of us flies from New York to LA, and then LA to New York, it's two tons of carbon dioxide that we push into the atmosphere. When you fly in a private jet, it's 79. Every flight, filling our global lungs with oxygen that, that's hard to breathe, this carbon dioxide that, that changes the nature of our, of our life. And I thought about it so much like a cell, like these cells in my body. Earth is like a cell, it's an ecosystem, it's a conscious entity. It behaves, it believes. And so we see these beautiful jungles around our planet that are full of life, yet we tear them down. We cut them over these years. And so when I was congratulating us for our vegan dinner, most of the deforestation that happens in the world, 75% of it is to grow cattle. We cut down the jungles and, and grow animals to eat. And I really want to impress upon you, when you go out for dinner and you eat a steak, see this image of the earth being cut down to grow that steak. I'm not the militant vegan here, but I want us to be conscious about our actions. You could see various countries around the world, Bolivia as an example. And so when we cut down our trees, we fill the world with carbon dioxide, we dump garbage in the ocean. The ocean, by the way, is what helps the, the planet breathe. It take, absorbs carbon dioxide, and so it becomes acidic. We change the climate in a way that's very unpredictable. When the temperatures change, crops fail. When crops fail, people starve. When people starve, they move and migrate. And we're just heading into this stage where the amount of ice that's melting and the changing weather is something we're seeing. And we name it something like global warming. People think, oh, it's nicer to have a warmer climate. But it's not global warming, it's global chaos. And it really is. When you really look at it and you really apply yourself with that red pill and you ask yourself what's happening in our world, you see these issues and the possibility of some kind of apocalypse scenario becomes real. But these issues are not the ones I'm most concerned with. It's this, it's us. We work, we have jobs, we have meaning. Humans need meaning to survive. Yet we're replacing our jobs with technology, with robotics and artificial intelligence. We hear about it in the news all the time. It's a massive existential threat for humans. And we view this with the possibility of creating a utopian society which is a possibility, but it takes conscious effort for us to get there. And without conscious effort, it looks more like this. There's the us and the them, the 1% and everybody else. And as you replace the jobs for the drivers, the truck drivers, for the people that are low income, you have people that lose meaning. And when humans lose meaning and they lose their jobs, they become very different. We look at some of the stats, McKinsey and Co., 375 million people will have to retool for new jobs. 40% of the world's jobs will be replaced by robotics and artificial intelligence, and 25,000 truck drivers a month will lose their job. These kind of changes have never been seen in the history of humanity. And while once upon a time there was technology with the loom and the Luddites, and these things were scary, what followed was world war. And so we see this happening more and more. Every major category, from industrial workers to reporters to doctors. And there was a wonderful book that came out recently, Dreamland, that demonstrated that the opiate epidemic now 
in the United States, it's 71,000 people a year dying, more than have died in every major war the U.S. has had in the 20th century, are starting and originating not just from the addictive sell pills nature of big pharma, but in places where people have lost their job, where they've lost this meaning that's so important. Where they lose their job, their ability to provide for the family, stress goes up, pain goes up, illness emerges, and they come to doctors and they ask for help, and doctors don't have anything to give them. And so when Purdue Pharmaceuticals showed up and said, hey, we'll give you this, this pill that makes people feel better, doctors were so keen, in addition to being paid and given bonuses and all kinds of things to, to go on, on this magical adventure of selling opiates to millions and millions of people, they, they wanted to help. And, and so this trend, which we've seen in the opiate epidemic, uh, with the replacing of work and jobs, the question is, where does it go? Where, what happens when technology advances? This is something that, that few people, everyone hears about, but few people have an idea. And we've seen the movies, obviously. We're afraid of robots and how they, they face humanity. And we don't see that here. But if you live in the Middle East, you see it regularly. There are countries in the world where drones fly above, and based on the recognition of your face or what you search on your cell phone, an AI algorithm pulls the trigger and fires a missile into your house. This isn't the future, this is right now. And so as I was going through this process of learning and saying, you know, how are we going to have global impact, all these things were incredibly overwhelming, probably the same way that all of you were feeling right now. And so I was walking around telling people the apocalypse is coming, the apocalypse is coming, really, like I'm, um, who's that guy, Yankee Doodle or whatever? Uh, and then someone said to me, wow, that, you know, that's really smart. What's smart? <laughs> the apocalypse? No, the way you're saying it. What do you mean the way I'm saying it? And they defined apocalypse, which was the revealing of new knowledge, hidden knowledge that wasn't available before. And so as we approach these events, there's an opportunity for us to engage and learn something new. Yet as a human species, we're mostly concerned with arguing with each other. You watch the news about our politics, we're struggling, and, 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 and we are so much of our animal nature when we look out there. Um, funny, we picked this photo, and it's a Make America Great Again. Um, you know, he has a gun or a taser in his hand or something. Um. <laughs> so you see this, we see this. But we also see this awareness to, to consciousness. We see this curiosity. What's happening with the resurgence of psychedelic medicine? Some people had asked me about that earlier. Or, or Wim Hof. Anybody heard of Wim Hof? This guy that, that instead of freezing to death in six minutes of cold water can last two hours, some kind of magical experience. Wim is a good friend, and I met him in the healing journey before he was famous. And it was such a wonderful experience. And so these, these experiences that we, we speak about... Um, these experiences about, uh, about reality and the future and, and our greater awareness really brought me back to this experience I had with cancer and this precognitive experience, this, this sort of vision of the future that, explain, that, that it defies the explanation of physics. And for anybody who's seen the Matrix classic movie, right, bullets fly and the guy stops them, you know, Matrix was a wild movie, but as time goes on, all this idea of us being in the simulation continues, and so we wonder what is our reality. And so I wanted to go on this adventure. I'm going to throw a bunch of stuff at you here real quick. This adventure was, was something like you would see out of Harry Potter. A guy says, hey, there's this thing that happened, and now I'm going to go on this adventure. And it was a little bit difficult to get into first, but then I met some people. This guy's name is Paul Elder, the one on the, the far left. He lives around here. If you're curious, you can look him up. And the gentleman in the middle, Russell Targ, was the first physicist of the CIA. CIA hired in the 70s when they were trying to understand how the Soviets were using psychics to determine m information on military targets. Some people might have heard about the Stargate program. And so Russell and I spent some time together, and he introduced me to Joe McMonagle, who was remote viewer 001. Joe was a forward reconnaissance person in, in Vietnam, and where people lasted days, he had lasted something like 19 weeks. He just had a sense how not to fall into a trap or get shot. And so the CIA recruited him into this program that they ended up calling remote viewing. Has anybody ever heard of remote viewing? Okay, cool. And, and so remote viewing is this thing that, you know, crazy people do, and I don't know, and this is how most people experience it. A simple way of, of experiencing it is to put an image in an envelope. Um, someone does it. Let's say, you know, someone at that table puts an image in an envelope the day before, and they, they have this envelope, and you can't see through it, and there's a number on it. And then I go into a special meditative state, and I try and see what's in the envelope. 
So we do a drawing, and, and you, you get a sense. And so in this particular target, I had yellow flash, glow, light from above, nature, water, some kind of destructured plane, smoke, bomb, airplane crash. This was the sense that I got by, by tuning in consciousness to this envelope. And so when the target was pulled out of this envelope and it was TWA 800, it was quite a surprising experience to look at it again and see the parts of a plane with the kind of images that were associated with that on the web and to see them sort of shape around it. I hope you can all see the screen. You see the front of a plane, a, a missile coming up, and there's some debate about whether it was a bomb that went off in the plane or it was a, a rogue military missile that accidentally hit the plane. This, this experience of seeing inside this envelope for me was real. And for anybody that's curious about that, you can absolutely experience this. You can experience it yourself. And so I wanted to go down this rabbit hole a little bit further. I wanted to understand this idea of psychokinesis and PK. Can you move, can you modulate material reality? And so Russell, I'd asked Russell Targ, um, real guy, you can look him up, physicist, amazing, amazing story. He's written like five, six, seven books. I asked him who was the best with, with interfacing with material reality. And he said Uri Geller, this guy from Europe who is famous for bending spoons, who went on television and it didn't quite work the way it was supposed to. Uh, and everybody said, oh, Uri Geller's a fraud. But there were many years where everything worked before. So I went and visited him and saw him bend a spoon. And so that happened. And then I was curious about the science of it. So I went to go meet Dean Radden at the Institute of Nautic Sciences, where he studies how human consciousness interfaces with material reality. And it turns out that this is a, a real thing that science has measured. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I had a wonderful experience. For the first time, I tried tarot cards. I know, it just gets deeper, right? Tarot cards, seriously? Never thought I would use tarot cards. A business guy can't use tarot cards. You can't talk about that on stage. So I got this, this, this card, and I pulled this. And it was the most remarkable experience, one of those moments of awe and, and mystical nature. Because just that morning, for the first time ever, I'd been playing with this lamp. This photo was taken the morning of that card being pulled. And this is a, a random number generator that's in my lap that changes color based on how you change randomness without any physical intervention, just some kind of unknown mechanism. And we call this psi. This is a phenomenon, psi, ESP, consciousness, intention, you know, magic, whatever people want to say. And so this journey of going down this route really taught me that magic is everywhere. And I know for some of you, this, this is, yes, of course, common sense. For others, this is crazy. What are you doing? I don't believe it. And the reality is none of you can actually believe me for what I'm saying. I could tell you stories all day night, just like I had a, a dream and it was about this, or I had a mystical experience, or somebody spoke to me. It doesn't matter what I tell you. You can't believe my stories. You have to experience it for yourself. And so I became really curious about how to help people understand this greater reality that I was interfacing with. And as I started to look at it, we already know it. Anybody ever read The Secret? Okay, so the law of attraction. Something at work there, right? Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. Anthony Robbins, a lot of his principles in the same way. If you're a fan of the Bible, over 300 miracles, it says 290, but there's a few more than that. Or the Book of Saints, the, the Christian Catholic Church traveled around the world to look at people that, that had mystical experiences happen to them. The count is 10,000. There's 10,000 stories over time as the Christian Church has explored people that in the name of God have had these miracles happen. Some of them are crazy, like it didn't eat food for 20 years or levitated on stage. I'm not going to do that, by the way. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Maybe in the future. And so, so these things are documented in religion, and they're also something that we're quite fans of in our entertainment. Um, I, I was curious, uh, when we look at the movies that people watch, uh, did this have anything to do with the, the beliefs that I was coming across? And so it turns out that 47 out of 50 of the greatest grossing box office hits ever had some character with magic in it, which is about $40 billion that we spend watching movies about people with magic superpowers. Yet for me to stand on stage and tell you that you have superpowers is a crazy thing. Kind of funny, right? So I got a pop quiz for you. What percentage, 
Well, maybe I'll actually just see how everybody feels here. So when we talk about these you know, extraordinary natures of human consciousness, maybe ESP or extrasensory perception, the idea of knowing that someone's thinking about you or, or sensing something at a distance, I'm curious, who believes that that's real? Yes, I love it. It's about right. If you're not raising your hand, I hope that I can help change your mind in the next few minutes. <laughs> It's about 48% of Americans, which is about the same as what we have here in Canada, so it's wonderful. So we know that this stuff is real. In fact, when we look at a list of the different types of superpowers up at the top, clear empathy is one that we, we usually agree with, that we can sense people's emotion at distance. We can all kind of know when someone in our life is, is hurting or we need to reach out and make a phone call. It's, it's a thing, right? How does that work? We can't explain that in science fully yet. At the bottom is pyrokinesis. I think that means shooting fireballs out of your hand. I don't know about that one either. I mean, anything's possible. But um, interestingly enough, clairvoyance time, like having a precognitive experience, is there at about 12%. So me starting with, hey, yeah, I saw the future. It was really great. Probably not everybody in the room is on board with that. <laughs> but it's true. And maybe it's for you as well. So I wanted to understand the science on this, so we looked at the science. And it turns out that every major Ivy League university has had programs that research this kind of thing. And they've published affirmative papers that show that these kind of phenomena that we speak about, whether it's natural healing or remote healing or the power of prayer or, or intention or precognition or Princeton's program, the PEAR program, 20 years they ran a program that showed humans can influence randomness at first with electrons and photons, but then also with things that move, like that Plinko game, you could pull left or pull right. So we have these abilities, and they're validated in science. And when we look at the scientific literature, there are literally thousands of papers on this topic. To be a scientist in this space and put a paper up is quite a controversial thing, because you might publish it, and it gets this well-regarded, you know, peer-reviewed, everything, your, your measures are fantastic. But so many people get so upset, or a few people get so upset, that the journal has to retract that article. That they actually take these articles down, which they can usually only do in the name of fraud. And so there's this huge resistance. And despite the papers and the courageous scientists that are constantly publishing on this topic, it's still a really scary thing to do, to, to be a business guy and stand on stage and talk about that, or to be a scientist and, and put a paper out there or, or, or bet your budget on that. The government doesn't fund any of that research, and you've got to find crazy people like me that are, yeah, here you go, Dean. <laughs> do that. Get that new equipment. Let's, let's uncover the truth. And so of all these papers, there's one that's kind of a favorite. I'll just tell you about it real quick. It's, um, they have some, some little chicks, and they hatch the little chicks. And uh, there's a robot um, that's dressed like a chicken. And inside the chicken is a random number generator, and it determines whether it moves left or right. And so the chickens hatch, and they see the robot as mom, and they put them over to the side, uh, the side of this big uh, arena sort of area. And somehow, these chickens, without any known electrical connection mechanism, can shape randomness that the robot is pulled towards them. These chickens have some kind of psychokinesis that can pull the randomness of the universe towards, through the sheer love of mom. And so this phenomenon, when we look at the physicists, we have Einstein, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. We have Niels Bohr, everything we can Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. We have Heisenberg. No, not the guy who made drugs in the, the van for Breaking Bad fans, not that guy. The first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will turn you into an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. These physicists who defined the, the structure of how we think about science all were more mystics than scientists. We look at the foundation of psychology. William James, regarded as one of the people who invented modern psychology, he was a professor at, at Harvard. And uh, we are founding here a society for cyclical research under which innocent sounding names like ghosts and second sight, spiritualism, and all sorts of hobgoblins are going to be investigated by the most toned and cultured members of the community. And so th these people were, were, were into this stuff. Um, even, even Freud was, <laughs> you know, he's a pretty grumpy guy, right? Like you see his face, he doesn't look very happy. On his deathbed, he had one regret. And the regret was that he didn't spend his time and career studying thought transference. 
His students would write about all these mystical things that had happened, and he was too afraid to stand on the stage and talk about it because he felt that he would be lost and his, his theories and philosophies would be lost. Even Carl Jung was a massive fan of synchronicity. Magic at a macroscopic layer, how, how does human intention unfold reality? Yet one of my favorite is, is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So in the textbooks, you read that the top of the pyramid, and for anybody that doesn't know it, you're at the, the bottom, you have uh, physiological needs, so can you eat and have shelter, and, and then you have safety, and then there's belongingness and love, and then there's esteem. So if nobody claps at the end, I'm going to drop down. But if everybody claps and you come after and you're like, whoa, that was cool, then it'll be self-actualization because I'm living my best self here. And so this is what we see in the textbooks. But actually, that wasn't what he believed. It was kind of like a clipped version because what he had talked about was transcendence. In the later part of his life, he, he realized that he had his theory wrong. And the way that he described it was in a really profound way. Transcendence also means divine or godlike to go beyond merely human, to stress that this becoming very high or divine or godlike is part of human nature. And so this resonates with the consistent theme that we're seeing across. It can then feel some subjective equivalent of what has been attributed to God's only, omniscience, omnipotence, ubiquity. These things that we speak about, it's still a potentiality of human nature. And so Maslow, the, the person that you see, that everybody knows about their theories, this was what he believed. Was he a raving lunatic or was he wise, yet somehow not understood properly where his insights were hidden? And so we ask, how can we live in a world if these things are possibly true? Why don't we all just accept this? And why doesn't our power structure and our science accept this? And this is a little diagram that came around sort of World War II how capitalism on the top, and then we have our, our rulemaking and our government, and then our religions, and then our war, and then our rich people, the 1%, and then we have everybody else that just kind of goes through the system, and everybody that's the 99%. And so we look at our, our world, and we say that e each of these major systems, business, science, religion, governments, major power ecosystems of our world, corporations, their goal is for you to feel need, to want to buy things. I can tell you from personal experience. Anybody that's a business person, you want your customers to want to buy things. You look at religion, and I know that's a sensitive topic, not to challenge any particular philosophy, but to think about the ecosystem of religion, the, the dogma behind, hey, you have to pay, you have to follow these rules to be in touch with your higher power. Why isn't it free to pay? Why can't, uh, to, to pray? <laughs> Why can't I just connect to my higher power in that way that I feel right? Why does there have to be all these restrictions? And, and we look at governments modulating and, and running society by fear. And then we look at science, the dogma, people that, that invest their entire careers in things that aren't right but will persecute other people because they don't want to see truth. These are very powerful structures that, that crush the magic that we all have inside of us. And when we think about the impossible becoming possible, this is important to understand that the forces around you don't necessarily feel the same way. In fact, throughout the ages, for people that started to believe the kind of things I'm talking about or practice them, they often found themselves burning. Multiple times through society, magic would sort of come about and we would understand and accept that and then there would be a witch trial or, or, or burning or a hunt of some kind. And so there were these massive purges of this ideas we're talking about. And the question is why? Why, why, does this, why does this happen? What is this fear in us to our greatness? Really, because if I say you have so much more control over your life than you might give yourself credit for, this should be elation. But people experience fear. And moving through this tunnel of, of where am I now, the life I have, into this is very much like death. And so as I confronted cancer and as I confronted Everest, I felt like it was really something preparing me for this. As I thought about these experiences and I thought about this journey I had made, I had a lot less fear of death. I had a lot less fear of change. And so, so it gave me this ability to imagine. And when we think about beyond imagination, one of my challenges is to think about a world where these kind of things are encouraged instead of feared. In a place where people's natural healing abilities are studied and propagated and educated, where we push these things in ways that are amazing. Where the placebo mechanism, instead of being illegal and sending a doctor to prison, could be, could be utilized and challenged. Where we would put our research dollars into understanding the phenomenon of the greater nature of human consciousness. And where technology, instead of enslaving people by dragging out likes so that you hope that people like your post and you're just clamoring for that, could empower you to find a deeper self and a deeper truth, to figure out how to love yourself as compared to, to being afraid that nobody loves you. So 
I propose that this isn't just a possibility, but in the world that we live in today is a necessity, that it's an imperative. Does anybody know this woman? What about this guy? Or this woman? She looks a little funny, doesn't she? She's like her hat and her head is kind of mixing in there, and there's a bunch of letters down there. So these three people aren't actually real. They're generated by an algorithm, a general adversarial network that invents things, it invents people. This is today. This is happening. When we look on the internet and we say, oh, look, there's somebody's photo, we don't know whether that's real or that's an artificially generated photo. This is happening. Artificial intelligence is rising to the point that today, looking at a news article, a video, a photo, you have no idea whether that's real. And no one actually does. AI can't tell whether AI has generated a photo. This is our world today. It's a scary thought, isn't it, to not know what's real. But it's something that we have to embrace if we're to choose the future. We heard about Deep Blue beating... Uh, Kasparov a few years ago, it was 14 million moves that, um, that it studied to understand how to become the ch best chess player. The recent algorithm didn't have any moves and in four hours playing against itself learned how to beat Deep Blue. AI is advancing at a rate that's very hard for us to conceptualize. And this was foretold 20 years ago, the singularity, the technological singularity. An anybody ever heard of that? I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a very scary thought unless you approach it from the way that we're speaking about it. When we look at the singularity, it's the idea of artificial intelligence which is millions of times smarter than humans at its peak, and we look at nanotechnology, self-assembling nanomachines, and we look at quantum computing, which is very fast computing. And for many people, I notice a couple of yawns as I say that, it's scary, it's like we don't want to be a part of this. But the reality is it's happening today. And if you don't think about this, learn about this, take a position and take a stand, this technological advance that's been happening, where innovation is happening at faster and faster rates, will leave us behind. Because humanity is changing in a way that's very hard to explain. We are the caterpillar on the edge of the branch. We've eaten up our earth. In so many ways, the earth is dying. And we don't want to see that. We don't want to hear about that. We don't want to acknowledge that. The technology we've created bombing people. These algorithms are filtering and sorting people into internment camps right now in China. It's moving into other totalitarian governments. These things are happening right now in our world. And so the question is, what do we do about it? So I'm going to share with you now my version of this. Now that I've made the world so bleak and dark, maybe we can lighten it up a little bit. Um, over there we have a, um, a booth, and if you want to learn more about it, you can, you can see. We've created a company called Evolve Biologics. And this is about the evolution of humanity and the merger of, of us, human biology, with technology. And we look at the evolutionary roadmap. It's taken millions of years to get, to get here, to be sitting here, to be talking, to be eating, to be connecting, to be driving in the way that we are. And very soon, something else will come. Some might say less than 10 years. Some might say more than 10 years. I think many people are coming to the understanding that technology is advancing even faster than we can imagine, and it may be within 10 years. Do we emerge into some kind of cyborg society? Do we emerge into some version of human 2.0? Or is there some, uh, some, some spiritual awakening that we have, some awareness to a greater ability, to a greater nature that these people have been theorizing about for so long? Or does humanity end and some kind of killer robot algorithm just strips the earth of all us humans that are sitting here? This is a real thing that's happening right now that in the next five to 25 years will play out. And so as we look at human evolution, there's a couple different ways that we can evolve. We can be genetically engineered. You're hearing about this in the news. We can have epigenetic expression, um, uh, the way that we were speaking about cells changing their identity. They can evolve on the fly. We can look at interface with, with humans and technology and neurons connecting with computing. Or we can understand this sort of consciousness phenomenon and embrace in it and sort of think about uh, the elevation of humanity. And so our philosophy with Evolve is to focus on these components of the innate human nature, to look at a person and to look at 
how we live our life. Do we live our life in frustration and hate and fear and conflict? Or do we experience peace and love and joy? And, and looking at this sort of quantified scale of emotion with shame and guilt and fear and greed on the bottom, can we, can we move to a place where our life is redefined by these positive emotions? Transitioning humanity is something that, that technology has the potential to do. And moment to moment, it's possible to read the human biology and figure out what is it that we're experiencing. And that's exactly what we're doing. We've created a, a, a wearable platform. We have sensors that measure the body, that understand emotion and interpret emotion. And we create a, a process of tracking that over time and integrating people in a way where technology, instead of separating people and creating distance, brings us together with love and compassion to help choose and envision a new world, a new emotional experience for our, our evolution. And our three-phase plan is, is to first approach it in a simple way, stress, we can all identify with that, then to move to the emotional level to help those people that are so sad and depressed that opiates is the best life for them, or to retool that workforce for the truck driver that's known nothing else other than trucking to choose a different choice. And then eventually to measure that process of this higher nature of, of our human awareness that we speak about. And to create a symbiotic relationship with technology, these algorithms that are so dangerous to connect them with our higher self, where we sense ourself, our being, we provide the measurement of that and the understanding and then deliver content in a way that allows us to meet the stressors of our world in ways that evolve humanity and elevate our potential rather than driving it down. And to sort of bring this around to, to, to the close, the potential for what this looks like is really a question. I mean, I, in some ways, know as much as you. I've, I've studied this topic, I've met leading thinkers around the world, but it's a conversation that all of us have to be a part of. We have to be curious, we have to be open to this mystery, to these experiences, which for so long we've persecuted and pushed out of view. And if we do, the potential to, to arrive to a different kind of future, for that caterpillar to blossom into the utopian society that's wonderful beyond measure, for humanity to take its place in a new stand, in a new future, is, is here and it's possible. And really to bring it around to close, just to really push this to you, this red pill, blue pill choice, you can say that was a talk that was scary and let's just leave that alone, or you can bring some curiosity about this and, and bring an open mind to the experience of your life. Think about things in a little bit different way. Instead of being afraid of technology, start to learn about it and take a voice and, and be curious to these experiences that emerge in your life because they don't happen unless you're open to them. So on the theme of our talk, be curious, be bold, be bigger, be beyond. Thank you.